Welcome, Tony and Michelle, to this very special evening. It's good to uh, to be talking to you in, I believe, Brisbane in Australia. Yes, yes Thank Brisbane. You, Thank you. It's really good to be here. Yes, it's a beautiful evening in Brisbane. It's actually uh, evening, 7 p.m. here, and we're excited to be talking to you. I believe it's the morning. It is indeed, and that's that's when we're doing this this particular recording, as you know. Um, it's great to be able to um, to do this across time zones and across continents. And um, I just really wanted to say thank you very much for just not doing this with us uh, today. But also, in addition to that, the fact that you're going to be running your masterclass as well on the second and third of September quite specifically on um, emotional and behavioral management issues for autistic persons. Um, I just wanted to start off um, just finding out a little bit about um, what your position is on some of the issues I guess that you're going to be raising during the course of that two-day masterclass. And I thought we'd start off with a fairly basic question really, which was um, why do you think there's a need to look at the whole issue of behavioral and emotional management issues with, um, with autistic folk? Just a few thoughts. Uh, one is by definition, the person with autism is different. And so they are not born with a manual. And so you're having to, first of all, try conventional strategies, uh, affection, consoling, compassion, sometimes distraction and you find it's not working and you're having to use alternative strategies that may not be your first thought to be successful. And often parents will learn this and professionals in trial and error. So what we're doing is saving you an enormous amount of time and frustration in finding out what works. Wow, that's, uh, that's enormously valuable in itself and I think sort of sets the tone really for the two days. So let, let's start unpackaging this in, in a bit more detail really. Um, there are obviously a lot of traditional strategies that are around that are used for emotional management with neurotypical children and adolescents. Why not simply use those? Why, why, why might they not be so usable? Why might, why might it be that they either require adaption or maybe totally different strategies for young people who um, are autistic? Yes, great question. And that was one of the first sort of lines of question of, can we use traditional strategies? And I guess that's where we started using, for example, cognitive behavior therapy and found out very quickly that Yes, these techniques have value, but they need modification. There are a certain number of the strategies out there in traditional uh, methods of emotion management that we would say probably stay away from, you know, that perhaps uh, you wouldn't use as a first line. For example, in the behavior management uh, class of our strategies as psychologists, it's often, it's common to use things like quiet time, time out. In schools, for example, uh, disciplinary measures use suspensions and expulsions. And we find that these aren't very helpful because if you think about uh, what a child with autism often wants, it's solitude and it's time alone and it's quiet time and it's time out. So we can actually use, you know, some strategies that are perhaps uh, meant to help manage behavior, which can be around strong emotions, are not indicated at all. In fact, they're probably going to reinforce the behavior and the person learns how to be just a little bit naughty to get out of doing things because they get those wonderful rewards. The other aspect of this is, of course, in our traditional um, armory in psychotherapy uh, and counseling, we really rely on the interpersonal relationship mm -hmm. and being able to uh, tune into somebody else, empathically attune, read them, uh, stay with particular thoughts, emotions. And when we look at autism, one of the primary characteristics of someone with autism is they have a difficulty reading, understanding, and being able to automatically, intuitively get someone else and, and feeling comfortable in that relationship. So when we look at the psychotherapeutic relationship, we found that we need to bring a whole new range of ideas and strategies to understand autism so that we can meaningfully connect with that person. And so a lot of modifications are around 
how do I uh, have this relationship, this therapeutic relationship? How do I relate to this person? There's also in psychotherapy and emotion regulation strategies, typically, for example, in CBT and cognitive behavior therapy, there's an, a reliance on almost like an assumption that the client in front of you has access to an awareness of their bodily signals of what's going on moment by moment inside their bodies, in their minds, in terms of their thoughts and beliefs, and also in terms of their emotions. And we can't make that assumption in autism. In fact, a person with autism, by definition, will have difficulties recognizing their own and others' thoughts and emotions. So a classic sort of example is in a therapeutic context, we may ask as a counselor, psychologist, for example, how did that make you feel? And it's a really legitimate question, but for someone on the autism spectrum, that can be impossible to answer. They have no idea. There's no vocabulary, there's no reference point, and they're not being obtuse or difficult in therapy when they truly say, I have no idea, I, I don't know. So you can see that if we just enter into the therapeutic relationship with our arsenal of, of tools, there's some mistakes that we can make straight up in the very core of how we do therapy. So what we found is that in fact, you can still use a lot of the models of psychotherapy, like you know, cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness-based strategies, DBT, ACT, etc. but we do it with modifications. And so we have a range of modifications to go through. Okay, that's 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 really interesting and sort of make makes sense. So I can see from what you're saying, there are there are some strategies that might be used that, to be honest with you, will probably be ruled out altogether. And there's there's other ones that that will require quite a lot of modification in order to potentially use them. I mean, the, the situation that we've currently got at the moment um, with COVID, with lockdown, etc. Obviously affects everybody at present, and um, certainly there appears to be quite a lot of evidence around that it's particularly affected um, autistic people as well. And I, I just wondered what your thoughts were on how you think that the changes that have occurred in relation to COVID have created additional problems, really, in this whole behavioural and emotional management field. Yeah, I, I think COVID is a useful vehicle to explore autism. Now, one of the things that's going to occur with COVID is anxiety. Everyone is going to be anxious. There's the uncertainty. And what we find in autism is the person is actually very sensitive, in fact, oversensitive to negative mood in other people. So when other people are anxious, they infect those with autism, not by COVID, but by anxiety. So this is in the media, this is in conversations, and they pick up the anxiety, and that will cause all sorts of problems because quite a few autistic behaviors, routines, rituals, special interests, and so on, have a, a basis in managing anxiety. So one of the things you'll get with COVID is an actual increase in autistic behaviors as a coping mechanism for the anxiety. Now, it means that parents are gonna to have to validate the anxiety that you're worried about it and really go through recognizing that if you ask as Michelle was implying what is it about COVID that makes you anxious they often can't tell you and they're not being obtuse it's thinking about thoughts and feelings the alexithymia all those sorts of things are going to occur so the person is upset but can't define precisely what it is very worrying for others other components are uh, asking parents, one of the strategies we encourage is vocalize your thinking of how you cope with anxiety. Because the autistic kid sees mum and dad coping. But how did you do that? What I can't see, also I can't hear, what you did. So you go through and vocalize your thinking. If I'm calm, I'm smart. I will think of another way of coping with this situation. A whole range of things that as you vocalize, I will ask for help and reassurance from others so that the child has an opportunity to work out what you are doing and coping within that situation. But there's also going to be changes in routine. This is another classic autistic problem is in DSM B 
two, I think it is, is needing sameness and routine and consistency. Now it's gone. And as far as that person is concerned, my routine for the day, the thing that helped me cope with that structure of what is going to occur, now there's the intolerance of uncertainty, not quite knowing what is going to occur. Now, the autistic uh, child may also have issues in terms of um, um, in the, what's going to happen is people will try and use affection and compassion. And sometimes, as far as the autistic kid's concerned, it's not a hug, it's a squeeze. And why are you squeezing me? And how does squeezing me stop COVID? So that's going to be another concern. But I'd, I'd like to finish on th this point, um, that if we look at the vaccines uh, in Oxford and all the other places, I strongly suspect that most of the scientists exploring the different types of vaccine are on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the solution to COVID may come from someone who's autistic. That's a very, very interesting point, in fact. And I, I, I guess that it, 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 it highlights to some degree um, a positive potential relationship here between um, autism and, and COVID, which is, which is a, a strange thing to be saying here. But I, I, I think that the, the, the points that you raise are really helpful and, and, and useful. Um, I know that, that, that folks um, vary quite considerably in terms of level of functioning, um, but can you say a little bit about how you see intellectual functioning, communication skills, severity of need? Can you say a little bit about how you think that should influence the way in which therapists might deal with behavioral and emotional problems? for folks who are yeah, autistic. Uh, absolutely, yeah, Th sorry, thanks Paul. I think that's a great question. The, uh, the complexity of the profile of the person in front of you can be quite overwhelming to uh, any, any therapist, however experienced. Uh, we know that autism rarely comes in in its pure form of just autism. It usually has all these uh, comorbid or co-occurring conditions and those conditions each interplay with each other as you suggest. How uh, the thinking skills are, how the learning style is, whether the person does have an intellectual impairment or just specific learning difficulties for reading, maths, etc. The social communication skills, the adaptive functioning skills, what we found to be helpful is having an understanding of each of the conditions separately. So we would say, for example, uh, be very interested in if somebody was uh, functioning at a particular level cognitively, of course, to be able to adjust the type of learning within the therapeutic context and also with the sorts of accommodations that we might make for any school or work environment so that there isn't an unrealistic expectation for that person. And in autism, the unrealistic expectation can go low. So for example, if somebody has no language, uh, there can be an assumption that there isn't the thought, but there is the oh, thought. Yes. They can yeah. have incredible intellectual gifts, but not the language to communicate them. And you can imagine how frustrating that will be. So how that will then play up, out potentially in tension, in emotional dysregulation, as the person cannot communicate uh, what's going on. Uh, and yet uh, they have the depth of thought of, of any of us mm. that can't uh, convey that, can't convey their emotions to others, can't relate to them and can't describe need. So the communication level can be from non-existent or very limited language, like echolalia, for example, repeating uh, what someone else says or what they say over and over again, right through to the most eloquent, most professorial type <laughs> capacity for speech. Pontificating. Very much so. And yet uh, there's not a lot of relating going on. So there's a monologue. And within that whole spectrum, we can see how that could interplay then with uh, the communication problems with uh, how the capacity for friendship, whether or not the person can get into a career, win a job interview, uh, succeed in a therapeutic context to really understand emotions and the regulation of those emotions, it can impact across the board. 
we found that to be forewarned, if you like, is to be forearmed. So if we know about the person's profile and we know not only autism is at play here, but there's these other conditions as well, including, for example, perhaps uh, very severe executive functioning skills that uh, really impact on adaptive functioning, then we know more. How do we make environmental accommodations? How do we scaffold this person? And which areas can we meaningfully intervene in? And what are the priorities for those? And I'd like to make a comment on that because what Michelle was partly alluding to there was not just behavior modification, it's environmental modification mm. and attitude modification. Mm. And these can be very valuable in the strategies for emotion management. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting point that you you raise, really. I think, I think that there is sometimes a tendency to attribute any difficulties at all to, that the individual might have to autism without necessarily taking into consideration these other factors, which, from what you're saying, actually require assessment in their own right before we can then start properly working with with these folks and, and with their particular needs have i got that right absolutely you have and one of the areas in i think one of your first questions is the differences sensory sensitivity uh typical kids don't have that but these kids do a lot of escape behavior or the sensory experience is painful and they'll thump somebody because they they actually made a sound that they really don't like so you've got to be aware in analyzing behavior and emotion the many different levels and characteristics of autism what's going on here it's never usually one reason there are a combination mm. It's interesting, when I first started in this area, say the first 10 years in, I had clinical psychologist friends who would say, you're still doing autism, isn't that boring? You think, oh, wow, you know, it's an interesting, I think that speaks to the, uh, that, I guess, generalized view that people can have, that if you specialize in autism, you're treating autism, you're not treating autism. We don't want to treat autism. We don't want to cure autism. We love autism. It's just that autism comes along sometimes with these comorbid conditions uh, that really cause problems, especially when autism is also at play. So you have, say, a very high anxiety uh, disorder, very severe levels of anxiety with executive functioning issues and perhaps a learning disorder. And that's a very common presentation in our clinic, but we're treating all of that through the lens of autism. So autism is primary in our formulation, but and will really influence how we uh, choose our strategies and the way we approach the family and the client, certainly. But we're still actually uh, perhaps most concerned for someone like that with their anxiety. That's what we're treating, but through the lens of autism. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that again, if, if, I'm, if I'm getting this right, what, what, what this seems to suggest to me is that with autistic clients, the therapist needs to actually have not only a pretty broad assessment of different elements, um, but also probably needs to have a potentially very wide toolbox to draw from because of the different combinations. <laughs> that's of these why you're never bored. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's why you know, and you're always finding new tools. The problem in, in autism, there are only usually three tools in the emotion repair toolbox, smash it, solitude, and special that's interest. interest. Yeah. And what one of our roles, in fact, in the program, we develop the toolbox to include many different strategies. Right. Well, that's that's that sounds fantastic. And, and I guess it links in really with uh, my last question, which was, you know, when folks do come to this particular masterclass on the 2nd and 3rd of September, what do you think is going to be the thing that they're going to be that they're going to find most valuable in taking away from, from that, those particular two days? What's going to be most valuable is recognizing that the autistic person is incredibly brave and stoic in coping with life and neurotypicals. But I'm going to go through a little bit of what more is involved in that. Because we, we go through why? Why is emotion a difficulty? Because there are neurological reasons, social reasons, experience reasons. Why would someone with autism be prone to very intense emotions? We will also go through 
all emotions, because in autism, it's not just the clinical sad, angry and anxious. It's how do you resonate with the happiness of other people? I don't like it. I don't know how to relax. And, and, and people keep squeezing me and, and, and saying they love me. And, and how does that solve my problems? So it's other emotions we will go through as well. But one of the central components is learning about emotions, how to read a face. For example, many with autism think any ambiguous face is angry. You're angry with me, which dictates how they're going to respond. And then you've got an anger issue that's occurring. So we go through a lot of work on emotion education within yourself, within other people, far more than you would do with a typical individual. They know this. They know that that person is feeling this, that and the other. They know how to fix it. They know that they are being kind and nice. They know the difference between accidental and deliberate. But we are going to also focus on the toolbox with things like physical activity, which is a way of, shall we say, expressing the energy, because in part, it's not just behavior management. We're looking at what emotion drives the behavior. And when it's emotion management, we also call it energy management. And there's too much energy. So tools in the toolbox can include physical activity. Uh, often those with autism, no, I don't like it. Uh, it is incredibly helpful. It is yoga, meditation, mindfulness. Michelle is an expert in this area. She has taught me an enormous amount and I have great respect for the value, especially of yoga and meditation in autism. We go through people. In other words, how people can calm, not accentuate the agitation. We will go through, how do you cope with a meltdown? How do you know when they're on their way? The do's and don'ts of meltdowns. But we're also going to focus on tricky issues like depression, which can occur in a six, seven, eight year old with autism. Person I was reading about today, uh, run around the house with a knife saying, I want to die, I want to die, mum, kill me, kill me. I don't have a reason to live. I think he was seven years old and a depression attack. And that's a very autistic characteristic. So the most common problem is anxiety, but we often find that anger is actually due to anxiety, frustration to anger, and depression is expressed as an agitated, externalized depression. They go into attack mode. They don't blame themselves, they blame others. So that's what we focus on in the program. Wow, well, wow, that's certainly going to be um, a content packed um, two days. So um, I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, joining us today. And uh, we look forward to actually seeing you later on in the year on the 2nd and 3rd of September. And uh, yeah, take care looking, and look after yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah, it, it, It's our only opportunity to get back to England. <laughs> <laughs> yes, in this form. <laughs> yeah, you take care. Lovely. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.